Yeah, welcome everyone. I'm Pat Cannon. I'm the staff member, uh, a staff member at Sierra Club, Maine. And we're so happy that you've all come to our community conversation today with the ACLU of Maine. Um, Marianne will introduce the speaker and say a few more words, but um, just a quick over, oops, sorry about that. Quick overview for those who need a refresher. Um, we will have folks on mute just while um, the speaker is talking. You can feel free to be on video or not. It is great to see you all if you are available to do that. And uh, we will have the chat open for questions. Um, either me, it seems like Allison will be taking a good amount of those. Um, and that is all I have for logistics. So I'm happy that you all have come and I'll hand it over to Marianne. Okay, well, I too want to welcome you to this Zoom conversation. Uh, the Sierra Club Maine is very pleased to have with us uh, Allison Bahia, who is Executive Director of the ACLU. As you know, in these difficult times, it's very important for us to stay connected with one another and especially give, give one another support as we carry on important work of groups like uh, the Sierra Club Maine and the ACLU. Now, Allison has a very impressive background. Besides, uh, she's been with the ACLU here in Maine the last six years. And before that, she was um, at the Maine Law School where she was director of admissions and an adjunct professor of juvenile justice, well, juvenile law. Um, at the Muskie School of Public Service, she advocated for juvenile justice policy reform and she represented youth in the courts. She has gotten various awards <clears throat> in 2003. Well, first in 2003, she co-founded Kids Legal, which provides legal representation or legal services to children uh, throughout the state. <clears throat> Excuse me. Uh, she received uh, the main judicial branches uh, advocate for justice award in 2004. And as I was mentioning before we formally started this, I was very inspired by her representation, her testimony where she talked about the need for better representation of those who cannot afford counsel. Today, she's going to be sharing with us her reflections on the recent elections and what that means for Maine. Take it away, Allison. Thank you, Marianne. Thank you for that kind introduction and thank you all for being here. Marianne, I want you to let, know that you, you are following in the endless line of people that mispronounced my name. So I'm just going to, which is, it seems like so far, it, just so you know, even within the family, we, we pronounce it differently. So you're not, you're in good company, but okay. it is, it is <laughs> yes, yeah, so my father and I pronounce it differently. It is true. It is BA. BA. Uh, so okay. my name is Allison BA. I am the director of BA. the ACLU. Um, Mr. Brodigam, super nice to see your face down there in the bottom of my screen. John, you, John and I go back way, 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 many decades now in Maine. Um, so nice to see you. Uh, I'm delighted to be here today, and um, I would really, um, before I sort of start my remarks, I, I am a, I'm a huge fan of the chat function on these calls, and I would love to know what you're thinking about, what you'd like me to be talking about. Marianne and I have already talked about how many things I could go into, but please feel free to pop them in the chat as you're going, or questions, or what you're thinking about, because that will help me know um, where we should go. There's so many things we could talk about, so don't hesitate. I'll keep the chat button open. Um, and we can go from there. So as Marianne said, I've been, uh, well, you know, in addition to 2020 being a big year for the election, it's a big year for me, I turned 50. So it's a year of reflection. And I'm thinking back on about 30 years now that I've been advocating for different issues related to civil rights. And I think it's, you know, for me, it was a very easy path to pick. I had role models in my family um, who all worked in nonprofit, but most importantly, my mother worked at the ACLU when I was a kid. But a little known fact is that my father worked at the National Audubon Society. So when I was growing up, I was surrounded by two sort of incredible role models, uh, one who was working on social justice and one was who, who was working on environmental issues. And I grew up, um, I think like many people in, in, in my generation um, or until recently, thinking that that was really a choice. You could choose to work on social justice or you could work on the environment and that they really weren't connected. So you, you picked people or you picked the planet and that that was just the path that you were gonna, you were gonna walk. 
And I think increasingly over the last, uh, at least certainly the last decade and maybe a little bit longer, we're recognizing that those issues are fundamentally in interconnected. That we can't have justice for people if we don't have protection of the planet and how, and I know Sierra Club has been doing some incredible thinking on that. I'm particularly impressed with um, Mr. Hopkins and the organization who writes, who wrote so powerfully this summer about how, um, you know, environmental degradation is, is so interconnected with racism and the oppression of communities um, who have been traditionally marginalized. And so I really see this as an exciting moment. Um, so I'm particularly like as a personal issue, happy to be at the Sierra Club. I've never spoken to an environmental group before. I hope you're the first of many. And, um, and I've been really grateful for Sierra Club. It was, it was really great to be partnering on the voting work um, and the Secretary of State uh, debate. So that's been terrific. And just a little thought that I think that we have um, reached a point, I don't know, John, it's hard to imagine that my daughter now is 20, right? Our kids, we, we started having kids around the same time. Uh, but my daughter has decided to go the path of my father into science. And so she's studying uh, planetary health and uh, what's, she's studying the, the oceans. And what is interesting when I talk to her is that she sees it as completely interconnected. So her passion is about how indigenous communities are being affected disproportionately and at a, you know, in a different way because of rising sea levels and because of pollution in the waters. And so I see this, this, this new generation taking this in a, whole new, um, in a whole new way. So I'm excited about the, the way our movements need to work together and we'll only achieve justice if we do work together. So super happy to be here. Marianne mentioned about the, uh, the election. Well, um, it is a little bit hard to believe that it was only, um, you know, what, four weeks ago, five weeks ago, that we, we, uh, the election is over. Um, it feels almost uh, like a lifetime ago. Um, there was certainly, most of our organizations were working for, for months, if not years, to, to gear up for it. Um, and I, I don't want to minimize the, the importance of um, electing, and it looks like now we really will have a transfer of power. So although I haven't 100% let my guard down, I'm, I am starting to relax. Um, I'm sleeping slightly better. I won't entirely rest until January 20th, but, um, but I think, you know, I don't wanna minimize the importance of putting uh, back in the White House, someone who is not, uh, you know, overtly racist, overtly homophobic, overtly um, attempting to, you know, destroy the planet in, in all of the many ways that, that the, the current president has really dismantled so many parts of our democracy. So it will make an enormous change to have a, an administration that is, um, that is uh, at least attempting to do, to do a better job around issues that the ACLU cares about. Don't worry though, ACLU has sued every president since 1920, so we're not stopping now. We'll certainly go after President Biden when the time is right. But um, for now, let's, I think we are, we are pleased that we uh, will be welcoming an administration that has a much better um, vision for what, our vision of what the constitution means. So yes, it's good news. That does not mean though that we are not facing enormous challenges, um, both because of the repair that needs to be done, but also just because of where we are as a country. I think we have to hold two things at the same time after watching this election. I mean, the first is, is that an astronomical number of people voted to keep President Trump in office uh, on an overtly racist policy uh, platform um, in a way that we, we probably have never seen in our history, uh, at least if I'm gonna go with that historical statement, never seen before. So we have an enormous number of people in this country that think that sort of racist uh, platform is appropriate, that we should be attacking communities of color, that we should be attacking immigrants and many other uh, groups as well. And yet at the same time, we have seen both in the election and in the four years leading up to it, you know, in some way, I don't know if you want to call it an awakening or a resurgence or an, an understanding of how injustice has been woven into the fabric of our country from before, you know, before our constitution was even written from the very beginning, from the taking of land from indigenous communities. And so now people of color have been telling white people this for a very long time, for centuries, in fact, um, so it's not that this information wasn't known, but it is appreciated now in a way that I don't think we have ever done. And I, and I, um, uh, I think in addition to that, just watching the energy of, of I, I, I'm old enough now to call them the youth, 
but the youth, you know, the young people, they're incredible. I mean, I think it is fair to say that, I mean, or at least I'm hopeful to seem to think that the people of younger generations are, are have a different awareness, certainly ones that many of us didn't have growing up. So, so we have to hold these two, these two truths together, right? We have enormous amount of um, people in this country who are, are willing to trample on people's civil rights and we have an awakening. So what does that mean for Maine? Um, I think it means <laughs> We have a lot of work to do. It means that at the ACLU and other civil rights organizations, we have to work with the energy that's been generated over the last four years to protect immigrants, to protect low-income folks, to protect people of color. Um, and yet understand that the government um, is slow to respond, is slow to recognize how racism permeates everything we do. So. We could talk about any system. We could talk about, as Marianne mentioned, the public defender or the lack of a public defender system here in Maine. We could talk about the education system. We could talk about uh, the healthcare system. We could talk about any of those systems and we would be able to find enormous disparities around race and, um, uh, and outcomes in Maine. But I think um, I will go to the, um, uh, I'm gonna go, because Marianne was the one who asked it first, so I'm gonna go straight to the criminal legal system because I think it is one that um, many of us don't think about. We don't, you know, if, we, if you haven't had someone in your life that has been impacted by the criminal legal system, you don't often understand how it permeates. And part of the reason you may not understand that is that criminal legal system has been a, um, a system that has traditionally oppressed communities of color. So black and brown and particularly black and brown men, although increasingly women, have been a target of this system throughout the throughout centuries and throughout the, the state. Um, and I guess I would say that's one of the things that is a surprise to people in Maine is that, um, and I don't know if you hear this, but certainly I hear this a lot is, you know, Allison, racism just isn't a problem in Maine. You know, we don't have any people of color here with a white estate. So we really, I don't know why you're talking about it so much. It's just not a problem. Now, the last 12 months have made that almost impossible for people to say, but I would say up until the last 12 months, I still would hear that when I would, when I would give talks or, or be talking about issues. So we are definitely still in a place in Maine where people do not want or do not, are not aware of this disparity. So on the criminal legal system at every single stage from arrest to charging, to sentencing, to length of sentence, everything. There are disparities based on race. So we have a population of a little less than 2% of people of color, but you'll see that in arrests, we have their 8% their eight of arrests. There are 8% of arrests for drugs, even though we know in Maine that black and white people use drugs at the same rate. They are, I always get it, uh, so yeah, I always try to write it down because sometimes I get a little bit dramatic with my with my percentages and then people at the office have to rein me back in. But 11% um, of the people incarcerated, for those of you who, I don't know if you ever got to meet the former Dean of the law school, Danielle Conway, but in her first week in Maine, she went to, John, I don't know if you know this story. She went up to the prison in, in Warren and it was, it was a really important moment that she, she wanted to, um, to take as, you know, to, to suggest how important it was to her by being there her first week. And she walked into, and she was with the warden and she had had a tour and she said, so this is where you keep all your black people in Maine. It was a really, I mean, it, it is a really painful and yet true statement that we are, we like, we don't think that that's happening in Maine, but it is absolutely happening in Maine. When I represented children at Long Creek, when I worked in the, in the, in the juvenile system, it is, you know, it is not, well, I live in Southern Maine, but it is not kids from Cape Elizabeth. Cape Elizabeth kids do not end up at Long Creek. Kids from Lewis and Auburn end up in Long Creek. There is an enormous racial disparity. So we have a system that at every stage rips people out of their communities and does it in a disproportionate way. And we can't, and you know, I'm interested in all of your thoughts on this, um, but we still find this an uphill battle in the state legislature or in communities. And so you've been hearing a lot about the defunding the police movement. You've heard it from the ACLU, you hear it from Black Lives Matter, you hear it from advocacy organizations all over, all over the country. 
it is still a struggle for many people to understand how policing is an extension and has been an extension of oppression of people of color. So we have a lot of work to do here in Maine around civil rights. The election will be helpful, but it is not enough. We have democratic control in Maine, and yet we have struggled to get reform passed on criminal issues. Marianne mentioned the public defender system or the lack thereof, another example of here in Maine that um, low income folks who typically or are disproportionately people of color in Maine, you know, 29% uh, of, let me get that right to not overspeak that, 29% of people of color in Maine are living in poverty. And that's a pretty breathtaking number. And so those, if you then add that getting caught in the criminal legal system, you can see how these disparities just, you know, roll out. And then in terms of we, you know, uh, the disparities happen in, in everything. And I'm sure you're thinking about that. We, um, we look at, uh, you, you just watched my brain go into like 17 other things I want to talk to you about and <laughs> trying, to, trying to, uh, to, to stay at least with the criminal legal system for a minute. So we see that that is an area that is incredibly important for our advocacy because it is so based in a racial or a lack of racial justice lens. And so you see the ACLU talking a lot about that. And again, although a Biden administration will be helpful, it's really about advocacy at the state level and we still have a lot of work to do. Um, I just wanna pause there for a second and see if anyone had any questions about that particular issue um, before we move on. Oh, well, um, so Marion asked about ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. Um, we are, um, many people, again, this, this actually goes to a bit of the, the, the point I was making before. In Maine, I think there's a perception that um, issues of immigration, issues of race and racial injustice aren't prevalent. But we actually, um, we are increasingly finding that ICE and Customs and uh, CBP is, uh, spending lots of time in Maine. And we have a, we actually have a number of lawsuits against ICE right now, um, including uh, issues related to the border. We're seeing more and more of people up on the Canadian border um, being sent from the Southern border to try to um, instill would be, I guess the right word, instill other agents with the same sort of racist derogatory unconstitutional searches and attacks on, on immigrants um, to sort of perpetuate Trump's efforts to attack um, immigrants and people of color generally. So we have, um, uh, okay, thank you, Claudia. Um, so we have uh, worked really hard to try to uh, curtail ICE and CBP's behavior. Our method of doing that has been to sue them, um, hoping to make it tired, you know, get them tired of messing up in Maine. We had a, a, a bunch of advocacy where there was, do you, I don't know if you all remember when there was boarding of buses, the Greyhound buses. So that was an important part of a multi-state advocacy actually with ACLU of New Hampshire, ACLU of Maine um, and other affiliates around the country of working with businesses to try to stand up to that kind of, I mean, really shocking tactics of, you know, sort of pulling people off of buses, you know, show me your papers kind of state. I mean, if there's, if there's anything we want to be pushing back as a, as a, as a country or state where, you know, um, we, we think it's acceptable to uh, violate the law, call people out, and all based on, you know, what the color of their skin or the language they're speaking. So we have had pretty decent success pushing back against ICE, but I think increasingly um, it will be a problem. That is an area where the Biden administration should be, um, should be helpful in terms of rolling back some of the um, protections. Although for those, you know, I'm sure many of you are aware that under Obama, it's not like we had exactly fantastic immigration policies. Um, there, he was one of the larger, he um, deported some of the largest groups of uh, immigrants in the history of our country. So uh, Democrats don't necessarily um, join us in all the issues. Uh, I mean, it'd be great if they did, but there's still plenty of work for us to do around Democrats. Um, the legislature, just Claudia, to your point about the bill in the legislature, um, right now there it is going. It, it is uh, there's conversations about increasing an appropriation to the um, MCILS, um, which would 
increase the amount of money that's being paid to public, to, they're not public defenders, but to court appointed attorneys. Um, and so that is what we're working on right now is what kind of restructuring they will do of the office and what kind of whether or not they will um, change the organization. There's not, unless something has been put in recently that I'm not aware of, there's not a specific bill, but there is a ton of advocacy um, going on. And um, I can get back to you on the specifics, but right now a lot of it's been around what the governor will offer in terms of funding. Um, and that has, we've gotten some mixed signals on that. I, I think I would like to point out though, and I, I don't know if you as environmental groups uh, struggle with this issue, um, in sort of thinking about cleanup, um, I don't know if there's an analogy here, but one of the things that we think it's really important to remind people of is, yes, we want people to have good attorneys if they're charged with a crime, but we really wanna be asking, why are they being charged with the crime in the first place, right? So we, just like you don't wanna spend all your time on a cleanup in an environmental site, we wanna make sure how are people allowed to pollute in the first place, right? So we want to be having the conversation. We did, not, we did not used to arrest this many people. This is completely new in the last 30 to 40 years. This is a complete change in how this country handled incarceration. And so Maine has some of the toughest drug laws in the country. So we incarcerate a, an enormous number of people for what is relatively low level amounts of drugs for personal use. That's far beyond what most states do. So we think that we need to shrink the system. So we don't want to just work on propping up a system, we want to actually take the money that's being spent in a criminal legal system and send it on education or housing or all the things that make it less likely that people are going to end up in the criminal legal system. Um, so the, yes, Jane, so we on our website um, do like keep a list of all the cases that we have going. Um, and we, but it is, it is sometimes people, it's uh are not aware that although we are thought of as a law firm and we really are, we're one of the largest or maybe the largest civil rights organ legal organization and law firm in the country. We do so much advocacy in the legislature and John can speak of that since we've done so much of it with him um, and some many of the groups he's involved with. So we do, um, we, do, we do a lot in the legislature and even on the municipal level. So you'll also see some of the um, advocacy that we do in other areas, but you can see um, the lawsuits there as well. So John, um, we must be actively anti-racist in our actions. Um, so that's a, I mean, that, isn't that the question? That is what we all need to ask and that's what we all need to figure out. I think there's, a, there's going to be a bill in the legislature right now, which I think is a really interesting proposal around racial impact statements. And it's actually borrowed from the environmental uh, movement about thinking about just like the environmentalists advocated for um, in the past saying like, before you, before you do something, let's think about what the impact is on the environment. Well, it's the same idea now, before we pass a bill that seems neutral on its face, let's look at what it will really do to communities of color. So um, I think that that has, John, I think that's a really exciting opportunity to even just shift the paradigm, right? To ask the questions of how the lens of how things can be facial. We use it in the law, we say facially neutral. So like on theory, it doesn't impact, but it, you know, in, in practicality it does. So, you know, here this thinking about something like education and COVID, right? The governor had to respond pretty quickly because the idea was, okay, we're gonna go remote, right? We're gonna let everybody go remote and that will solve that problem without, we needed to think, well, that was like, that should apply to everyone equally, but no, it didn't children with disabilities, children who didn't have internet, children whose parents had to work. And so we need to be thinking about when we have policy recommendations that they do not, um, you know, that they do not end up impacting um, certain groups more than others. So I think that's, you know, again, part of what we're doing. And then also is to, um, and it seems like Sierra Club is it really, doing this with incredible passion and uh, I'm very impressed is we also have to really investigate our own organizations. We can't just be looking external to where there are challenges. We need to look at our own organizations and how we also make decisions in ways that might um, seem facially neutral, but in fact are, are actually um, not having, they're having a disproportionate impact on how we govern or on our staff or the issues that we pick. So I think that it's both an inside and an outside job. 
how we do that. Um, and I think the other way is, I, I remember that I've had so many learning moments as the ED of the ACLU. Um, I remember uh, in my first, I think it was my first year, I was really excited about a collaboration we we're gonna do. And I was, you know, I had to set, a, we really affirmatively uh, prioritized racial justice as an organization. And I was speaking to a staff person about how we need to bring a whole group together of, this is back in 2014, 2015, before people were really talking about racial justice and me and the way they are now and saying, you know, well, we need to, we need to, we need to get people from the immigrant community and we need to have a meeting and we need to, you know, essentially bring them in so we can, we can figure out what we should do next. <laughs> and the staff person said, um, why do they have to come to our table? Right? Like, no, we go to that, we'll go to them, we'll go to those communities, we'll ask what is needed. We will try to understand what the communities are looking for and then we'll figure out what's the best way to serve. Because for a long time as nonprofits, we have assumed that we know the answers and those nonprofits have typically been um, run and led by white people. Uh, the boards have, the staff have. And so it's a really important paradigm shift to make sure that we are, the communities who are most directly impacted are have, a, have a, not only a seat at the table, but that maybe we're going to their table, not as opposed to, or even better that the, the table's all set together um, in our organization. So I think that's another important part of how we do anti-racist work is making sure who's, make, who's making the decisions who's um who has access to power is is equitable and and we're informed by not just intellectually what we think is happening um so it's kind of off of the specifics of criminal legal reform but i think a really important part of of that um all right that covers i think that question unless john you want to jump in anything on that if that if that brought up anything for you I'm sure a lot, but not by a chat button. <laughs> no, that, no, that was that was great. Very, very thoughtful, and consistent with what I was I was hoping and expecting you would say. So it's yeah. perfect. It's a it's a path, isn't it, John? We're all on a path. We're all on a path of of evolution of growth, and we're trying to do it in the most um, thoughtful way. And we're making mistakes, and we're having success, and. Um, we can't be afraid of the learning and we can't be afraid of the mistakes because um, that is uh, that is going to be part of this as we, we do that. Um, so we talked a little bit about criminal legal reform. We've talked about immigration. Um, another um, issue that we continue to prioritize are um, uh, basic issues of, of access to abortion care and women's rights or um, uh, you know, and how that plays out in the state. It's another place where you see disparities of, of access to healthcare. And so we continue to remain focused. Maine is in particularly good shape on, on those issues right now. We have a governor who's very supportive of access to abortion um, and very, very proud of our work um, in collaboration with the governor's office. Um, had some really important wins last session. And so this is a place where I think Maine is a leader um, and will continue to be a leader and, and can serve as, um, dare I say hope, for, the, for some of the other parts of the, of the country where access to abortion care is, is uh, in some states, you know, virtually non-existent. And so what does that mean? Um, and so we'll continue to, to work with our allies um, in different coalitions to make sure, but again, we have a, a, a lot of support and, in, in the state on that issue. Um, and then the, the other area that we will continue and probably um, more than ever work on is, is, is voting. And it's a place where the Sierra Club and ACLU have already partnered and hopefully will continue to partner. There is, um, as many of you may know, Maine has some of the best voting rights in the country. We should be incredibly proud of where we are. Um, and how do I explain it? Because I don't want to, <laughs> we have, we have, we are in a great place, but it doesn't mean that we don't face challenges. So very often I'm explaining, well, yes, we have the best laws, but every year we will face some sort of voter ID law. And every year those, uh, those attempts to whittle away at voting rights gets stronger and stronger. And so I think what we're expecting to see post-election is 
a, a very increased attack on voting rights based on um, what's happening uh, at the federal level. Much of the damage that's being done around the allegations of fraud is to lay the groundwork for a, um, an assault on voting rights all across the country moving forward. So in red states, purple states, and blue states, at the ACLU, we're expecting to see um, efforts like we've never seen to use this election as an excuse to require state legislatures to, um, to sort of roll back access to voting. It's a very effective tactic to keep people out. I mean, and we can see what happens when that doesn't work. You can see what happened in Georgia when you know, there was a concerted effort to increase the voting rolls, to increase access to the polls. It can change the outcome of elections. Now, at the ACLU, we're not concerned about necessarily the outcome of an election. What we're concerned about is groups who have been traditionally not able to vote do not lose their right to vote. So um, I, I think we are looking at a um, uh, both um, sort of a nationwide attempt to, to roll back voting rights and then also thinking about how Maine can be a leader in that. As many, as you all know, we just, um, the state legislature just elected their uh, secretary of state, who's also the former executive director of the ACLU which um, poses opportunities. Although my biggest, my biggest hope is at some point that the new secretary, incoming secretary of state will ask us to sue her so that we can have a, a caption that says ACLU of Maine versus Jenna Bellows, which I think would, I mean, what former ED of the ACLU would want that on their wall? I mean, that just seems like a dream. Um, so, uh, so I think we have opportunities here in Maine to, to go even further with voting, but I, but I don't believe that um, we will be immune from attacks. And I think there will be a very concerted, um, concentrated and coordinated effort around the country to, to roll back on that. The ACLU, like the Sierra Club, has the advantage of having offices in every state and having advocates in every state. And so I feel pretty optimistic um, that, uh, the ACLU is ready in a way we've never been ready. I, you know, I don't know what you all are finding, but the, there's not too many silver linings of Zoom, but one of the silver linings is as an organization, we have, um, we have done more collaboration across states than we've ever done because this idea that you have to get together in person, clearly we don't need to do that. We can make things happen over Zoom. And so we actually had, um, an entire, for the last seven or eight months, had a voting coalition of about six, excuse me, 16 states that worked together in battleground states, Maine was one of them, of having, working with national, working with affiliates with pretty, I mean, we really predicted every possible thing that could go wrong um, in the way only true ACLU people can worry about. You know, we, the, our parade of horribles is pretty impressive, but it, it worked and it allowed collaboration and we shared staff between affiliates, we shared staff with national, and it showed us the power of what we can do, that we don't need to be tied to location, that we can be much more uh, collaborative and, and, and um, work remotely. So that will, will um, give us a lot, of, a lot to build on when these attacks come in the next legislative sessions, whether it's in Kentucky, Mississippi, Maine. You know, so I think that there's a lot of opportunity. And yes, Kathy, we are very much gonna be pushing on online, online voter registration. I think that's a key a key issue um, to work on. And I think there's a lot of, um, it was interesting in the debate that uh, de the Secretary of State debate, everyone seemed pretty comfortable with that as a reform. So I think we will definitely push to, to, um, <clears throat> to hold them, to, to hold Secretary, incoming Secretary of State bellows to that, to that issue. Um, and referendum initiatives as well, Marianne, I mean, that's another issue is um, what does that look like when, um, uh, um, we have the people's people's energies just sort of ignored and what does that look like and making it harder and harder to get things on the ballot. So it's something we're very concerned about. But we have Mr. Brodigan to worry about all that. So I'm counting on you, John, to, um, to do that. So that's a great question, Carol, about the rural counties in Maine. I, um, we have ACLU members in every part of the state. So, you know, Fort Kent, Kittery, you know, and you know, Penobscot, the, the whole the whole gamut. Obviously, we are much more. Uh, we have a much higher percentage in southern Maine and sort of Portland area, and then along the coast, which is I think fairly typical of more progressive organizations. But we do have presence um, everywhere. 
I think we, I think there's opportunity for, for us as organizations, whether it's Sierra Club or, or ACLU, we actually did a, um, we did a little pilot project um, a few months ago in lead up to the election where we um, did some um, advertising, some, you know, and I'm the oldest one in the office. So of course they're trying to explain to me what digital advertising is. And I'm like, wait, what? I don't understand. Is this going, what, Facebook? Wait a minute, I, it's a commercial? I don't understand. And all that being said, we ended up working to have nonpartisan um, advertising that encouraged people to register and to vote and to vote absentee. So it was just about getting out the vote. And what was interesting about, we targeted a population of about 35,000 people. And what we saw was that, um, first of all, we actually had a lot, um, I guess they call it like the click-through rate, you know, like people actually engaged with us at a much higher level than we would have expected in a, in a rural area when sometimes, you know, given the ACLU, um, we weren't really sure what our brand would be like in the rural second CD. And so there's a lot of interest in people. We won't know for sure until we see who voted, how well we actually did. But what was fascinating was to see in the younger cohort, how many of those people did not identify with Democrats. You know, they did not identify with a party. They're independent, they're not aligned. And there was a lot of interest and there was a lot of clicks or whatever, whatever they call it. There's a lot of um, interest in our information and they did not and they seemed interested in ACLU as a brand or as a as an organization that would be trusted. So I think that there's a lot of opportunity for us to be thinking about rural communities and my experience from representing, you know, just not even from ACLU but from my whole career in Maine, rural communities, I mean when we when we increase access for communities of color or we increase access for disabled people these are, you know, which are core civil rights issues for the ACLU. We increase the quality of life for everyone, right? And that includes rural Mainers. That includes people who are feeling cut off from the system or people who don't have access to good health care or have to drive. These are, there are ways the system discriminates against people who are not in the power, right? And not in the, in the hubs. And so I think that there's a lot of opportunity to, um, to, change the narrative about what rural Mainers think about um, and what they care about. And I, I, I say that because we also have seen in some of the district attorney work that we did. So district attorneys are, you know, um, on behalf of the, the state, they will charge people with crimes, but we've seen a lot of interest in the rural communities about what is their district attorney doing and how are they serving their rural communities and how are they in fact keeping certain family members, you know, certain segments of the rural population sort of held down. So the same thing that happens to communities of color also happens to poor rural communities. So I think there's a lot of, um, a lot of uh, opportunity for us to, to find alliances and allegiances and collaboration there. Um, so uh, I agree with the premise of your question, John, they are very legitimate grievances of our tribes. Um, uh, we worked uh, quite hard last year on the um, um, the recommendations of the. Uh, uh, I'm going to get all the names wrong now, but the um, to to sort of redo the Maine Claims Settlement Act. And I know that I I, I think I, I think I know this that the environmental groups were split on this issue. Is that uh, that there was some that there was uh, or that some environmental groups were coming out relative pretty strong, even though there was concern that tribal communities would have less restrictions on what they could do on tribal lands from an environmental perspective. So I would say in terms of how we can support is um, obviously showing up in the legislature is an incredibly important way of doing that. I think that um, it's learning um, how to be a, a good ally. It's to understand what the community is looking for. It is certainly, um, it is to, um, I mean, be in communication and conversation and ask for what is needed. I think we feel that tribal sovereignty is, um, is a core issue for indigenous people here in Maine and that it is something the ACLU should support. We've worked on a number of issues with the tribes over the years. We, were, we worked with the, them on the mascot issue. As you may remember, Maine became uh, the first state to sort of completely ban mascots. Um, and so that was been part of our work. We're working, we've worked with the tribes over different issues related to targeting by law enforcement. 
of tribal members based on their license plates. And so we've, we've been doing some tribal work, although I would suggest we should be doing more. It is still probably um, one of the one of the harder places for, and maybe for also for Maine lawyers. Uh, lawyers get really hung up on um, issues related to authority and sovereignty. And it's a tricky concept for a lot of lawyers to understand. And so I still, um, I have a lot of conversations with ACLU members around, you know, um, why shouldn't the Land and Claim Settlement Act stand? It's a contract. Um, and so our position is, is that it does need to be renegotiated and it wasn't appropriately done and, and that sovereignty needs to be restored. So I think um, is getting involved, understanding what the tribes need. The tribes have formed the Wabanaki Alliance, a C4, um, which I think will go far to helping um, have more coordinated voice at the legislature. So we are looking to do whatever we can to support them. Obviously, tribal state relations are pretty poor. It's not an area of um, great um, collaboration. Um, and that has been true for the last few administrations. So I think it's a, uh, but I think there's been real progress in terms of, um, at, you know, predict, you know, non-tribal organizations like ACLU and others to sort of really speak up loudly about that this is an issue. And I would also say we, you know, the environmental issues we were involved in with the tribes on the Penobscot water case in terms of the quality of the water and advocating for um, them to have their tribal, that their fishing rights were being, you know, that the pollution was a problem for their fishing rights. So I think there's a lot of uh, collaboration that we, we could we could do there. Um, so what else do people want to talk about? Yeah. Oh, police in schools. Oh, okay. <laughs> CMP transmission corridor. That is one you're all going to have to talk to me about. You're going to have to educate me about the CMP corridor and whether, where there's, if there's opportunity or whether we should be involved in that. Because that is one that I, I've been asking my youngest child to try to explain it to me. So, uh, so I may have to pass on the CMP, but I will talk about police in schools. Um, so this goes back to the issue I was referring to about, we have decided that law enforcement is the solution to every problem. So we've decided it's a solution to mental health problems. It's a solution to substance use disorder. It's the solution to underfunded schools. And I'm just gonna tell you, it's not the solution to any of those things, period. Law enforcement is not the solution. The solution is investment in our communities. The solution is investment in our people. The solution is connection with community. That's the solution, not law enforcement. So one of the troubling trends over the last 20 years, just like in every other incarceration issue and criminal legal issue is starting to put kids in schools. And I know you're gonna be shocked when I say this, but guess which are the kids that get arrested in school? Yeah, they're the kids of color. They're not the white kids, or if they're white kids, they're the poor white kids. So it is a it is disproportionately, and that's not all about the police. I'm not I'm not suggesting that the police are themselves like always targeting people of color. Let's not forget that every one of us was born and raised in a community, in a society that is, you know, the underpinnings are are racist. The movies we watch, the television we watch, the language we use. You cannot grow up in America without being racialized. You cannot grow up with having, with, and it's true for people of color too. So it is, I'm not suggesting that every, you know, law enforcement goes into the school. I mean, many SROs I think are pretty lovely people. You know, that they, they want to be part of their community. They want to go in. The problem is, is that law enforcement is still law enforcement. They have guns, they have access to the court system. They have act, they, and when someone gets caught in the criminal justice system, they do not get out easily. Most kids who go into the system, you know, if they're diverted out right away, they're usually fine. But the kids who get caught in the system, they're caught in there for so many different reasons and law enforcement isn't gonna solve them. 
And a lot of those kids, I think right now at Long Creek, something like 85% have significant and, and serious mental health diagnosis. I mean, we should be outraged at that. We should be outraged that our community is saying the solution for significant mental health is a prison. So now obviously it's not SROs and police and schools did not cause that problem, but it's another manifestation of where we're choosing to spend our money. We could just as easily put more social workers in school. We could just as easily fund schools at a different level, put health clinics in schools, make sure kids have enough to eat. So when we put law enforcement in schools, we, we make kids the enemy and we use the criminal justice system to solve problems that are, that are not about, that don't have a law enforcement solution. Um, so Ned, okay, Ned, is this the Ned Claxton? Um, oh boy, okay, I'm very nice to see you or hear from you. So I agree. Um, I mean, or I certainly, um, I need some language that is not as triggering for someone to defund the police. I, I certainly understand that. And right side of the police doesn't have the same impact. Yes. I think it is, well, let's just say, first of all, isn't it amazing that we're even having that conversation, right? That we're even talking about what does it mean? What is the proper role of police? So even though I think many people have said, um, defund the police is trigger, right? It's really, people don't understand it. It's, it's both very threatening to law enforcement, it's threatening to people who think communities are need to, you know, law enforcement needs to be safer. Um, but it started a conversation, right? It got people's attention. It certainly did that. And we all know as advocates, sometimes you need to get people's attention. You know, you need to get them to have the conversation. But what we really are talking about is, although I don't know, I, right size isn't so bad. I mean, you know, some of it is we are, that is exactly what we're talking about. We have over relied on parts of our system. You know, it's like working, it's like doing, it's like only lifting part of, you know, one part of your body and growing at something that is too big and not supporting the other sizes. I mean, you can see this in, if you look at, in your local community, if you look at what police are responding to, these are not massive public safety issues, right? This is just, this is, this is not a, a place that we want to. I mean, so we could, it doesn't mean police need to use their, lose their jobs, but that money could be spent and police could do a different role. It doesn't mean we don't need support in the community. It's just not necessarily law enforcement. So yeah, reimagine public safety. Although John, I don't know. And part of the thing I think we've struggled with is that this, this really idea that it, by letting it be safety, that, that makes it sort of already assume that there is already such a dangerous community. And I think we have to uh, probe a little bit and get a little curious about how much of safety has been coded words for who's safe and who's not safe. And what we've been taught about, about white and black and, and, and who's a risk to us. But I, but I agree with you, we do need to reimagine. Um, we need to reimagine and that's gonna require a, a shifting of resources. And it does mean whenever we change, right? Change is difficult. Um, yeah, and I agree with you. I agree with you. Um, I can't call you Ned, I have to call you Senator. Sorry. You can call um, me Ned. Uh, um, it, that exactly, that we are trying to find a way. And, and so the, when I talk about it, I try to talk about communities need to know how to take care of, need, need to know and do know how to take care of themselves. And we need to find ways to connect, not divide. And those things are best done, in my opinion, not by people with guns, but by communities with healthcare and housing and, and access to, you know, whether it's a primary care provider or a social worker, or, you know, if a family's in trouble that they have food. And that isn't true for so many Mainers. And it's generationally not true. So I think I try to talk about it as reinvesting in our community in a different way. So I don't know if that's helpful. Thank you. Thanks, and I see we have 10 minutes left and I'm thinking it might be a good time to start winding down a little bit. Like if you have any closing remarks and I think Matt is going to say a few closing remarks about how people can get more involved with the Sierra Club and you might wanna talk about how people can get involved with the ACLU. Well, thank you very much for having me. As you could tell, I could keep going for a long time about so many of these issues. And I, one of the things I love so much about these kinds of conversations is that 
we don't always have the exact answer, but we will figure out the answer together. And so we need to have these conversations and continue to um, work together and learn from each other and not be afraid of uh, the, the messiness that sometimes comes along with that. And in terms of being part of the ACLU, um, well, you can always become an ACLU member, just like you can become a Sierra Club member. Um, and we're always looking for, uh, just like Sierra Club, I imagine activists and who wanna work in the legislature and volunteers. Um, but I wanna leave Matt a lot of time to talk about the Sierra Club, because that's what this is about, is how do you, how do you support the Sierra Club? So thank you very much for having me. And I also do want to thank you for a wonderful, wonderful conversation of so many things to think about. We're really blessed to have the ACLU Maine active as we are to have so many activists in the state. Okay, Matt, you want to talk about the Sierra? Sure, I, I'll just be very short because I'd love to hear more from Allison. And um, mm -hmm. I know we are wrapping up. Um, I will close the recording soon, but I don't know if you or others have some time and want to talk on this. Uh, platform, I'm happy to keep it open as well. Um, yeah, just real quick. I mean, we have a lot of teams. We are a grassroots organization, so we rely on volunteers. And um, we could always use more help, especially all across the state. We do represent every county as well. And we have a lot of members and supporters all across the state. Um, and I'll, I'll just put my email in the chat. I'm happy to connect with people. If they're interested in getting involved, um, our energy team to our climate action team, our legislative team is really kind of getting going right now um, to start advocating um, our state reps and senators. So thank you, Senator Claxton for being on the call. And um, yeah, I, I'll just leave it at that. I, I'd love to connect with you if you're interested and to learn more. We do have some volunteer webinars coming up, but um, love to leave any extra space for Allison or others as this was a really incredible talk. Thank you all for coming. Um, really, really interesting. Great. You want me to add, Marianne? I mean, you don't want to give me the microphone again. You, you <laughs> <laughs> well, you don't have that long. You, you, you said you had to leave it one. So I wanted to make sure you had enough time. So I appreciate it. I, I, you know, the world of back-to-back -back Zooms that I'm sure many of you live. Yeah. So. Well, I, I would just like to, to thank Allison. Um, there's been nobody who's been a better champion of some of the most vital issues that are both vital and neglected, unfortunately, by many of us who are activists of various kinds. Um, no better champion than, than, than you and, and the ACLU of Maine. And, um, you know, you've made such great strides in so many areas. You've really lifted up a lot of important issues and had a lot of great successes in terms of public education and advocacy and in the courts. And um, I don't know where we'd be without you. So you know, mm, amen. appreciate it, what you're doing. Thank you. It's, it is an honor to do the work and we do it with lots of groups and lots of people, many of whom you don't see, but they're out there working. So thank you. Yeah. Okay, I guess. And any last words from anyone? Okay. Thank you so much, Allison. Thank you so oh, much. You. We'll, we'll be in touch. Yes, look forward to working with you all in some time really soon. Thank you, Great. Allison. Thank, Thanks. Thank you all for coming. Bye-bye. Yeah.